Hello everyone and welcome to a video where I read two of my blog posts about a favourite record of mine that was re-recorded 19 years after the original and I didn't like the re-recording. Anyway, I wrote a blog post about it yesterday and then I decided to write another one about the re-recording and I was also tweeting out saying, would you like to listen to me actually talk and read out the blog post? So that's what I'm going to do in this video, just read the first and the second blog post. You can find a link to the blog in the description box where I talk about all the different types of music that I like. Now the record is Stormblast by Doom Bill Gear. If you're not into extreme music or black metal, then you're probably not going to like this record, but if you like that sort of stuff and you want to check it out, then you can find a link to it in the description box. In 1997, Dumu Bulgir released Infrone Darkness Triumphant, a defining record for the band, evolving their identity with a rich wall of sound production and writing music to captivate the more rhythm-eccentric styles of metal, producing mosh-friendly, aggressive riffs and manic breakdown moments. Its symphonic component was to be praised too, with gorgeous synths deepening the wild and dark atmosphere, the band created a vastly more appealing sound, only true in spirit and theme to black metal, but ditching the low fidelity and anti-music aspects. Before it came this gem of a record, which I adore, more so for the years of my youth I listened to it religiously than its actual merit. Twenty or so years later the band would go on to re-record it with a similar aesthetic to EDT, Musically though, it is a very different regardless of what aesthetic it is wrapped in. The original Stormblast shows the band maturing quickly from their flawed but spirited 4 all tid debut. The songs are rather similar in stature, simplistic power chord progressions from the guitars, tuneful synths with atmospheric tones backing them, and narrow rattling drums pattering without a lot of force or intensity. Previously, their drummer, Shagraf, steps up as the frontman playing guitars and performing the vocals with a textural approach, stretching the gutturals and snarling at the listener from a safe distance. They don't have an oomph or an immediacy about them, but simply groan and growl with throaty textures over the rest of the music in a way I quite like, but could easily see how it would turn others off. Some of the vocals are clean, deep and bellowing with a medieval heathen tone, and in Norwegian, something I've always adored. It adds mystery and an ancient feel to the record, which is mostly more uplifting than it is dark. Most of the songs find a way to shift gears between the darker and lighter, lighter passageways, often controlled by the synth's tone and the guitar's direction. The songs themselves are relatively simple affairs with multiple riffs, verses and choruses. As no spectacular feat of song structure, they tend to drone at the same intensity for the most part. Each song has its own moment of creativity. Antichrist, for example, messing around with vocal distortions and reverbs in its opening momentum shift. The symphonies mostly exist in the backdrop, adding a soft layer of atmosphere in a few bright and uplifting occasions. Pianos come to the forefront and treat us with gracious melodies dancing over the steady guitar riffs. For example, the title track Stormblast climaxes at the end, its best riff rocking out over and over with a gorgeous piano flowing a soothing melody over the top of it. The album is opened with a string and key section, an enchanting melody played over soft sorrowful strings. Sorgan's Kammer is the only solo track for keyboardist Stian Astrad, it's a memorable one, but one that is unfortunately discovered through the internet to have been lifted from a computer game without the rest of the band's knowledge. It still fits into the record perfectly though. Picking this record out after a fair few years since my last listen, it occurs to me that the production is rather narrow and thin. Each instrument alone is rather underwhelming, the bass isn't very deep, the guitar's fuzzy distortion is thin and tan, the drums lack punch, the pedals are loose and overall it feels rather narrow. It's amazing how it comes together, the synths fill in a lot of the lost space and in its individual inadequacies it finds a charming, spellbinding chemistry as a whole. It's a soft record despite being black metal, everything except the vocals don't feel particularly harsh or abrasive, and something worthy of note are the bass guitar riffs that on every other song or so find a moment to step up with a complimenting melody, and given the lack of depth they sound pleasant playing the higher notes. It's a record of atmosphere and indulgence crafted through simplicity. The result, an ancient realm of nostalgic wonder helped on by the Norwegian lyrics, something the band would ditch on their next record. 
This record represents a large portion of my youth, and my love for it is biased, but trying to take a more objective view on what's fascinating to me now is how primitive this record is. You could argue the production is poor and the music not as wild or unchained, but through all that, the charm is undeniable for me. Stormblast is a one-off, not a genre-defining record or even worthy of a mention when discussing black metal's history, but a brief moment in Dimu's history that does wonders for me personally. Nineteen years after the original record, Dimu Bagheer stepped into the studio to re-record the memorable Stormblast, stating it had always been their intention to produce the album with a similar modernised aesthetic to Enthroned Darkness Triumphant. The original is its own gem within the band's discography from the Low Fidelity era, where their symphonic side really came to fruition. I remember not being optimistic at the time that this was announced, and upon its release I've never cared for it much. It's enjoyable at least. I know these songs inside out though, but practically everything about the production value dispels the magic I remember so fondly. Gone is the opening melody composed on strings and pianos. Straight into the majestic cosmos we are hurtled, and after the opening riff, the shift to the epic choral choir synths is rather persuasive, but probably the record's best moment as the following riff feels hollow with the synths dropping out, and this is where its problems are first heard. Shagrath's scream, despite being meatier and stronger, doesn't have the same charm. Much could be said of his growling, guttural vocals too. They have more oomph, but that doesn't magnify anything about the Norwegian words being sung. The clean Norse chants, however, sound solid in comparison. The production here is simply too much for the music. Its charm was in its strangely soft and thin production which had a lot of magic extruding from the instruments that sounded individually narrow and weak. On MMV, the opposite is so. The drums are loud, powerful, and the bass pedals rattle away constantly under many riffs where they never reached such speeds previously. There are more blast beats, the tom rolls and fills are much more dense, and they become quite an intensive part of the music. Between them and the loud polished synths, the guitars get buried and smothered. The bass guitar rumbles low and gone are its high notes which stepped up into the forefront. With all of these changes, much of the chemistry is dismantled by lacking subtleties. The simps implore rich, dense tones in the mix so loud that they take a large focus of attention where once they complemented the other instruments. The simplistic nature of the music is stretched by this high-octane mix. There is so much oomph and energy in the instrument sound that any changes in tone, the coming and going of synth keys, sound out of balance and disproportionate. This is literally what it is, music written for a vastly different aesthetic. The drumming is especially disappointing. Hellhammer is a legend and I mean no disrespect, but his style is so fast and ferocious for this record, everything is done with double pedals and feels twice as fast, it's simply nauseating. The origin of the track Sorgan's Kammer means that it was dropped for a newly written track Sorgan's Kammer Del 2. This is possibly why the introduction melody for the record was dropped too. With that new track, Shagrath and Silenos also re-recorded a leftover, or Macta Slave, which has one riff sounding nothing like what they were writing in that era. Maybe they filled in the gaps on an old demo. These two tracks are the only reason to listen to this record. Everything else is vastly inferior to the original. And there you have it. That's me reading the two latest posts from my blogspot. You can find a link to the blogspot in the description box. You can find a link to the two records on YouTube as well. So thank you for listening to this video. Hope you enjoyed it. Let me know what you think of it with a comment down below. And I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.